we have a uh, English Chinese Mandarin live interpretation. We have a if you need this, uh, help yourself from the front desk. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Yes, um, now we are after the uh, welcome afternoon tea. Now we are uh, in a little bit like nightclub vibe without sound <laughs> and DJ. <laughs> yeah, um, so this year, of course, it's been uh, another exciting year that this is the eighth edition of the Adam Asia Discovers Asia meeting for contemporary performance. Uh, and my name is Riva. Um, so in this section, we would like to share with you and keep, by, kick off, by kicking off this section, we would like to share with you what's going on here for you to have a little bit backdrop because I saw some newcomers yeah. Yeah, to Taiwan or to Asia for the East Asia for the first time. So Adam, it's an initiative that I co-founded with the Taipei Performing Art Center since two, uh, in 2017. And the idea of formulating or creating this platform or project or network, whatever you call it, or family, uh, is really about like how in the institutional realms of performing arts in East Asia and Asia Pacific and even globally, that we can devote institutional resources, providing development, artistic development, um, platform and progress and facilitation to encourage artists to meet and work. Because um, in Asia Pacific region, because the asymmetry of the ecosystem, artists are having very rare chances to meet, to collaborate, to work together, or understanding each other's culture and work, uh, politically, socially, da da da. So we've been running this, and then we have actually built uh, a, this kind of like artist run, but empowered by institutions supporting system. And then every year we have the key critical program called Art, Adam Artist Lab. In this Adam Artist Lab, we always invite artists to lead a group of research, and normally in Taiwan but sometimes, many times outside Taipei as well, because for example, um, Taipei resource is somehow also limited. And in the past editions, we have, a, we, we've hosted a lot of like First Nation indigenous artists and a lot of um, the encounters are, were happening outside Taipei, for example. And then this year, we, we made this progress a bit even more interesting this is our first time to create this mobility between sense to COVID. Now we can travel again. Um, we, we, are, we work with um, Sasa Ping, the artistic director of Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting by Pam, and then with the facilitation of Taiwanese artist Ding Yun. And Ding Yun has been part of the Adam family history, being facilitator, being guest curator as well. So they together forming Thai Bangkok Taipei, two phases of research group. So the group of artists, they spend two weeks in Bangkok in June, and then they spend another two weeks, uh, maybe less than two weeks, um, in here in Taipei. And then so we kick off this section by introducing our critical program, and then uh, let's welcome Sasa Bing and Ding Yun. They're gonna tell you more about what's going on in Bangkok and now in Taipei. Hello, okay. Wow, that's louder than I thought. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm Sasa Pin Siyuanij, and thank you, River, for the introduction. I am the Artistic Director of BIPAM, or Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting. Actually, I will say this very briefly. Our meeting is happening next year in March in Bangkok. I have flyers over there. If you want to pick them up, maybe see you in Bangkok. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ding Yun, 
and I'm the first year of the Adam Lab participating artist and the second year of uh, the guest curator. And this time work with Sasa Bing as co-facilitator and I'm the artist and dramaturg and just like supporting artists to do <laughs> any work. Okay, and so there are, there have been different phases, I would say, of this initiative coming first from River and me talking together, deciding to bring along Ding Yun in the team. At first, we proposed the theme for the open call to, to seek the artists who will be with us. And the theme was their neighborhood, which is obviously a mixed word between there and neighborhood, which is a way for us to kind of focus on alternative history, her story, their story in specific localities, because we think that, okay, if the artist would be spending the phase in two cities, let's look at the cities, but maybe in a queer lens or queer exploration. So their neighborhood was a, a provocation towards that intention. And based on the theme, their neighborhood, seven artists, as you see on the pictures, are, have been selected and invited to join us. And I would like each of you to maybe stand up and say hi to everyone. Um, Chen Yu Tian. Duan Tan Tuan. Amrita Happy. And Narube Jaksu Suwan or Nice. Yon Natalie Mick. Nagara Wada. And Leu Wiji. Um, right after our sharing, you will meet each of them in the next session. So you will have a lot of time to uh, talk with them and discover what they're thinking about, what they're working on. And as the research in Bangkok, when it started and as it went on, uh, we have the, another opportunity to kind of revise the curatorial statement because of course, as things went, uh, things started to take shape and take place and form themselves in different ways. So things are a bit clearer on what the artists themselves are interested in and what kind of journey is, was actually taking place. So it came to the revised version of the curatorial statement, which I named Unsung Silhouettes. And is really, again, the queer take on history, her story, their story, which is reflected in many of the activities that we have done also hidden and buried stories of people and communities, especially under cities like Bangkok and Taipei, which are, look, look like very modern, you know, very developed, very shiny, very sparkle, very fun, very many, many things. But we would like to shine light about the, the um, surface that's just underneath all those sparkles in the two cities. But also very importantly, I think half or even maybe more than half of the lab is all about these artists building their own community as well. So it's also a lot about group dynamics uh, amongst the seven of them, but also the two of us. Yeah. So the nine of us in the end. <laughs> That's yes, I give this to you. Okay. you. <laughs> yeah, when we start to talk about what's going to happen in these two cities and gradually we found a lot of like similarities in yeah. it, no matter it's from your daily life or like the cost of the living or the experience of living there. Food, weather. Food, yeah. weather, yeah. Hot, went, ran a lot always. And, <clears throat> and it gradually developed into like, what is the major force influence of the society. So you can see the picture on your left side is Rama Ten. Now this is the king of, of Thailand. Thailand. Yeah. And you can you can talk more. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes I should. So um, uh, for officially we are a democratic country, quote unquote unquote unquote. 
um, and it's also called the constitutional monarchy, meaning the king is the head of state, but technically, uh, supposedly under the constitution, but practically that's another story. So that's where we come from. But also, I think we both, you can talk about the other picture now. We put the picture here also for me is that this picture is also physically everywhere in Thailand. It's really not just a conceptual thing. So that means whatever political orientation you might be standing on or leaning towards, this kind of power will still, you know, penetrate your thinking, your living, your being in many, many senses. Yeah, I just like try to give the chance to that you talk about Rama 10 because in Thailand you cannot talk it. Thank you. <laughs> and I cannot put it up like this. And Actually, if you take photos, don't tag me or Nice, who are the Thai artists. Please do not tag us. We might get in trouble. <laughs> so on the right side, uh, he is Chiang Kai Shet. Uh, he is the uh, he is the military commander, and in 1947, and bring the KMT Party retreated to Taiwan and build the Republic of China until now in Taiwan. So some people will see he is. He bring another political concrete to Taiwan and still colonize Taiwan. Some people don't think so. And we feel that now the semi-presidential system in Taiwan echo with the monarchy, con uh, constitutional monarchy system. It's kind of like echoing with like we tracing for the democracy process, but somehow go to the different approach of it. And another layer is we talk a lot about ghost, this kind of oppression or different kind of forces. You cannot really see them. Like in Thailand, the overpower of king, just like control it in the visible hand. And somehow we try to escape from the maybe the longest martial law in the history in the world and try to be democratic. But the ghost still there because now Taiwan commonly cannot be recognized as a country. So one is like a ghost inside, one is like facing to the globe and we are the ghost. And uh, from here, we will talk about what we have done in the lab, the program itself. And we're, we are not going to do this in the chronological order, but more like how the Bangkok and Taipei research takes place really in parallel. Like it's a really parallel design to offer to the participating artists these kind of uh, comparative uh, experience. And with the politics, we did uh, this activity, for example, it's called, again, Ghost of the Politics. And we worked with two Thai artists, with Chaya Atamat, last week you might have seen his work, and also Tanapon Akavatanyu, both theater directors who are very uh, into the political um, uprising and movements in Thailand. So we thought, uh, actually they created a walk through the main street, the one main street in Thailand where a lot of uprising and bloodshed and resistance happens to trace the history that shaped the society that is Bangkok and Thailand today. So that was in Bangkok. And we're, when we're in Taipei, that I invite uh, one scholar, Du Pei Yi, and one artist, Jimmy Zhang, to bring us back to 10 years ago in Taipei, there is a very big movement called 318 movement. It happened in 18 March, and we also call it Sunflower Movement. In that time, this because uh, the parliament want to pass a law uh, with the FTA in service, but quite like under table to pass it in 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds. And uh, the citizen just tried to uprise and against it for almost a month, and we occupied the parliament for a month. So that is also very influential to me, like as an artist, how to engage into the social scene and how to use our power or our tool to negotiate or to show something in the movement. So 
uh, Pei Yi did a lot of research. Uh, her specialty is on, on out, out, outside uh, art practices and <clears throat> outside and onsite, sorry. And Jimmy did uh, one audio performance just surrounded by the parliament and you can use your phone by GPS system. While you walk there, you can hear the story and the recording in that time. Yeah, so we talk a lot of, about this and kind of surprise actually, this is the 10th anniversary of this movement, but not really that many people talk about that in Taiwan now. Yeah. So yeah, politics and social movements as part, as a way to reflect back to, to art making also and art practices in both uh, places. Um, the next theme that we offered and we also came to encounter it again and again in different forms, which we will talk about, is water. Uh, water is uh, essential for both cities in Bangkok. The capital itself was built around this, the Chao Phraya River on the one side of the, the river. And it was, it used to be called the Venice of the East, I think. I don't know if it can really be claimed like that, but there were many canals back then before we had roads. And so we were, we invited Mike Hornblow, a uh, New Zealand born, but now based in Bangkok artist to uh, share with us his research, very extensive research on the water, waterways, especially the disappeared ones in Bangkok that shaped a lot of communities. And these communities are also, um, you know, having to struggle with the consequences of these waterways being uh, disappeared and kind of neglected and disregarded by, by the city. And also uh, its existence in contrast with the city's wish to develop, to become urban, to become gentrified. So uh, when we're in Taiwan and we try to talk about the sub substance water, so the substance water, we bring all of us to the reservoir and the cleaning water museum just very close to Cheju Hill they stay. And <clears throat> to talk about the modernization in Japanese colonial era, the first modern cleaning water system built in Taiwan, that how we try to control the water, how we try to be civilized in a sense. And they still keep this and to uh, show people that how water be controlled, yeah and talk about the river, not river, uh, talk about river, not river, uh, uh, compare with Chopra River that in Taipei, Taipei City and New Taipei City distinguished by Danshui River and Kelong River. But between them, there is a place very special called Shezi Island. And Sezi Island, sometimes they will call themselves as a kind of appendix, some part of your organs that it's not that necessary, but still need to be there. But it's also very important that Sezi Island, among, along with its history, that usually play the role about like a cleaning bottle, recycling factory, and making a lot of different kind of small item to build this city. But somehow, because the restriction of development of that area, so it become like, you can see new Taipei city developing and you can see Taipei city developing as well. But between that, just like underdeveloped and restricted to be developed, it's very interesting geographically in that concept to me. Even though like a few years ago, the Taipei city mayor just like promote that uh, we have to make it as a Taipei Manhattan, but it's just a propaganda, I think. So, Tai uh, Rong bring us to there because he lived there for a while and also worked with Foka Circus Art 
and produce one work related to Sezi Island called Disappearing Island. And connecting to this theme of urban development versus nature and communities and disappearing communities, uh, in Bangkok, we explored two things that I would like to talk about. Firstly, we had one day where we went to two biggest parks in Bangkok. And it's interesting because someone, well, some, a government, I cannot remember which one, decided to build what is called now green, the Green Mile in Bangkok to connect these two big parks so that as an urban person, you can uh, very conveniently walk between these two very big parks in Bangkok. But interestingly, they're actually built above some underprivileged communities. So you, in the middle picture, you're literally walking over these communities as you commute between the two parks. So this is kind of the way to, that the city tries to develop within the existing um, chaos, I would say. And also we visited Klong Tui, which is the biggest slum in Bangkok, right in the middle, kind of embedded in between very uh, high-end, luxurious, wealthy communities. But this very big slum is right there in the middle of all these wealthy uh, properties. And the inhabitants of um, the, the population of the Klong Tai community is up to 200,000 people, actually. And it's very common in Thailand to feel that the Klong Tai people are kind of poor, dangerous, uneducated, they are to be feared, to be hated even, disgusted by, by many or the mainstream media. But um, they are actually the people who feed the life in the city, that they are the laborers who are in the service industries, who are in the streets, in the restaurants, in the vendors, in the toilets, in the security guard, you know, posts. So they are the ones that are invisible, but they're actually the true force that gives life to the city. So we, I think this is a parallel picture with uh, Sergi Island, a little yep. bit, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe we talk too much about water, so. We had water. <laughs> we have water, just like in the first three days where we just arrived Taipei, and many schedule actually suspended because of the thunder shower in the afternoon. But somehow we also feel like that is a very special experience for most of the artists. And maybe let's check with them later. Yeah, maybe check with them later. Yeah. So uh, originally we also have other plan to see different sides yeah. of Tanshui River. The boat. Yeah, take the ferry, take the boat and to see more scenario and discuss more, but somehow we experience it through our body. So water <laughs> comes to us, we don't yeah, have to go into to, the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, another very big topic for us is gender and identity as flowing as water or very fluid um, as you know, a topic or a subject to be explored. In Bangkok, we visited, uh, this is Silom, so the nightlife, gay, drag queen, uh, red light district of, Thai, of Bangkok. And it was led by Ama Diva, uh, a drag artist, but also a theater director uh, herself. And she led us through these streets, which I found very interesting because it wasn't just the birth of the, the gay, uh, openly gay and LGBTQ community, but also it was a result of the wars, the Second World War and also the Cold War, the coming in of foreign soldiers, armies, gave uh, birth to the demands of these kind of businesses, for example. Um, also to expand on the interpretations of queer, these are two uh, activities. On this side, the topic was queer and media and we worked with a group called Sapphic Union to explore the Sapphic community and their existence in Thailand, which seems to be very openly queer already, but even the Sapphic community feels like they still need to make sense of their existence in Thailand. So and this discussion was led by the invitation to think of queer representation in different types of media. And on that side, we take queer as a verb now, not really as a noun, but but as an action itself. So we invited Patipon or Miss Oat up there, and she led a kind of queer 
sightseeing, which she herself was remote, but she gave us a lot of documents to read about kind of gossips or little stories around Bangkok. Little this gossips history that we could do while we sang karaoke for like four or five hours, right? We did karaoke and then read histories, but also building our own history, uh, personal history mapping on the ground. And in all these kind of fluidity, we explored different things together. Also, you know, got a bit bored sometimes, tired, sleep, rest. But in all of that, I think is another queer interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, and then in Taipei. <laughs> yeah. We don't have your permission. We just like we did it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So if we see like. Uh, drag as a tool of like how to express yourself and we just like make a one makeup tutorial and we invite one drag queen in Taiwan called Draggy Boo Boo to teach us like how to use these cosmetics and try to express yourself. Yeah, because maybe some artists did it before, but some not. So we arrange this into it and we wear it while we're in reception <laughs> this time. And after that, we have the, uh, we bring them to uh, LGBTQ district shimen and try to experience the different kind of vibe of drag queen show or go-go boy shows in Taipei. And we also bring the artist to this museum. It's quite small, but very adorable and very considerate, well-caring museum called Ama Museum. And Ama in Taiwanese means grandma. So this museum, the topic is surrounded by comfort woman in World War II. So they did a lot of research and also try to work with the community of the comfort woman in that time. And uh, the tour guide, Young, just delivered to us through the history since World War II until now, what happened with the comfort woman and also extended a little bit about like Me Too movement today or the sex abuse, violence, extra, extra, extra. So we just would like to give a little space for all the people who collaborated with us in the programs in Bangkok and Taipei. So there are many uh, artists, facilitator, also community leaders. Uh, do you want to read out the names? Or? Mm, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, so you can. Yes. Thank you to them as well. Without them, we would not have such an experience. And, but really, Outside of all the curated programs, we think that, again, a very important part of the lab is community in the making, which are ourselves. Spending time together, talking, eating, drinking, playing, dancing, hanging out, experimenting all together. And you could see the variety of things we did together, expression the one enjoying mango in Thailand, and uh, also having an artistic uh, workshop exchange as a way to learn about each other, hanging out in my apartment actually, doing a group dance, you know, many things, many things. So just to say that it wasn't just about what we curated or designed as the program. Part, a really big part of the lab is the friendships, relationships, and collaborative spirit that is building and brewing in the group all the time, up until today, probably still will still go on for the next days, months, years. And... So these words that is mostly like quite happen in our conversation quite with, often. Also with the artists, yeah. Also with the artists, especially it's okay. <laughs> when everything that cannot really communicate, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So these keywords, it's uh, these hashtags, is are a kind of hint for the following presentation that you're gonna meet each of them in their presentations. Yeah. So you can take a look and start to navigate 
and uh, guess what's gonna happen with who, with how. Who. Um, we will open a bit of time for Q&A and at four o'clock you will meet all the artists again here. And just to say that uh, the you will see that the, in the schedule it's divided into like 40 minutes, 40 minutes, 40 minutes for the next two days as well. But actually the artists have many things to share. So within the 40 minutes, maybe you will encounter works by three, four different artists. So, and we have this updated list of who is doing which work at the, the entrance, I think. So you can also check that this would be the experience that you will have in the coming hours and days. Yeah. I think we can open for it's questions. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, we can we can take questions. Yes. <laughs> Should we turn on the lights? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe because we're done with the projection. Sorry, it has to be dark because otherwise the projection cannot really be seen. <laughs> But now we can see your faces. <laughs> if, if not, then we can take a break then, maybe, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, and then at four, you will come back in. There'll be a bit of facilitation, but very easy. And you will meet all the artists here in this studio at four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.